Hello, this is Frank Falvey with Frank Presents, and today it's my privilege and honor to have Jay Elias, attorney. Sir. Jay, we met at this wonderful uh, event in uh, Attleboro at, at a uh, Episcopal church, and you prepared this booklet. That's right. Uh, that is absolutely wonderful, fascinating, all around uh, uh, end of life in older adult health care, as I would describe it. There was yourself, there was a lady that I previously had on the show from Aging Well, and uh, the pastor and a few other people mainly talking to old, older adults about uh, health care and end of life. Today, we're going to talk about end of life and funerals and what happens. But to begin with, could you kind of introduce who you are? Certainly. Um, and we did meet um, at Grace Episcopal Church. Um, and there was a representative also from a palliative care agency uh, from Providence. Um, so Jay Elias and I am an attorney, uh, a health care attorney by background and experience. I was for many years a senior partner at a law firm in Massachusetts and Rhode Island specializing in health care law. So I represented hospitals and doctors, nurses, health care agencies. And I was also very involved in a lot of different nonprofit health care related businesses. Um, after 25 plus years practicing law, uh, I was ready for a change. Uh, and a good friend of mine, uh, with whom I played squash for many years, uh, is a fellow by the name of Michael Lake, and he owned Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. So after a couple of years of talking and, and trying to figure things out, um, we created a position for me to join Dyer Lake full time. And so I'm the legal counsel there. Uh, funeral home doesn't need a full-time lawyer. Um, so what I do is a lot of the business-related work there. I'm also there as a courtesy, no-cost uh, resource for families that come to Dyer Lake, whether someone's planning a funeral or someone is uh, doing estate planning, pre-planning their funeral. If they have general questions, uh, what's probate mean? Um, what is my role, what kind of documents are there, and things of that sort. And so I generally sort of put my arms around the family and give them guidance. Same thing after someone has passed away, if they're just overwhelmed and overloaded. Do I have to pay my mom's credit card? Um, am I responsible for paying her mortgage? And general guidance, and then specifics I make referrals at no cost, there's no financial benefit to me or Dyer Lake to uh, practicing attorneys or insurance people or accountants, whoever it may be. Um, and so one of the things I do is I'm responsible for all our community involvement. And so the program, for example, where you attended was one of those kinds of community involvements where I speak on healthcare related end of life issues. Um, I also do that at some area hospitals where I'm very involved and senior centers, assisted living facilities, and the like. Uh, the one you attended was called Being Good Stewards right. to the End. Right. Um, and my piece of it was talking about funerals, uh, end of life planning, and I think maybe we're going to be chatting a little bit about those advanced directives like the yeah. health care proxies. Yeah. So that's my story. I'm something of a square peg in a round <laughs> hole, um, but it works. It works. Yes, sir. Well, let, let's begin about uh, talking about funerals. Okay. Um, our end of life stuff. Back in the 30s and 40s and even into the 50s, to me, funerals were much different. Uh, people actually even on welfare bought life insurance. And, and, and every week, the insurance man might come to the house and collect the premium. It, it, it was a big thing when someone passed away to have, in essence, a big splash, whether the, the funeral was in the home or at a funeral home. Uh, uh, the family got together, uh, friends got together. It not only was a time for grieving, but it was a time uh, to really kind of go all out 
and, and kind of lavishly uh, have a funeral in remembrance. And I can always remember, I lived near the Forest Hill Cemetery and Lock Hill Street Cemetery, and on uh, Memorial Day, all the Italian women would be dressed in black, walk up the street, have a picnic at the gravesite. What's mm. happening today? Could you describe mm. what's happening today in, in funerals? Absolutely. You've covered a lot of territory in that statement. Um, years earlier than that, even, uh, funerals uh, were uh, taking place in the people's homes themselves, as you right. said. Um, and uh, they evolved into having freestanding funeral homes, many of which, uh, including Dyer Lake before Michael Lake owned it, the family lived upstairs. The funeral director, in, in, in our case, it was a gentleman named Ed Dyer, who raised his children, I believe he had five daughters, upstairs. Downstairs was the funeral parlor, as they called it, and the funeral home, the business. And that was consistent with the way a lot of funeral homes around the country, and particularly in New England, were. And it was here, a home. Here in Franklin, the Gimbley a funeral home, which used to be the Jackson funeral home years and years ago, lived upstairs. And I'm not sure there might even be people now yeah. living upstairs. Same I'm not concept. Sure. Um, things have, uh, and when you were referring to, uh, people would have the full traditional funeral service is what sort of is what it's often called a traditional service. Mm -hmm. um, the visitation or wake or calling hours, followed by a service of some kind followed then by a burial, typically. Um, there are still many traditional services. Uh, I think a lot of what has changed is just the way we function as a society now. Um, Michael Lake and I were chatting about this uh, in anticipation of me coming here today to talk to you. I, I wanted to hear in his words how he thought things have changed. And the first thing he said was that technology and society has changed in the way people communicate, for example. Um, people are so much more comfortable now uh, expressing their condolences, giving their uh, support through um, going online, on posting something on Facebook, um, sending a text or an email to someone, and, and almost feeling like that discharges their responsibility and moral obligation to, instead of putting their arms around the grieved uh, family, um, to be able to just make this acknowledgement um, technologically, if you will. Um, there are still many, many traditional services. Uh, clearly, um, the, the, the situation has changed somewhat, um, but we still see a lot of traditional services. Um, one thing you talked about was life insurance. Um, the cost of life insurance has increased significantly. Um, people have other expenses that they attend to first uh, before they pay their insurance or have deductions taken out. Very few few employers offer life insurance like they used to. The whole situation with life insurance has changed um, drastically. Um, we still see people who have their life insurance. It's not quite a way of life like it used to be uh, decades ago. Uh, I, uh, I think that's a mistake. but but. Uh, I, th I People think people don't plan a f as far in advance as they used to either. Right, now it's right. it's a very uh, uh, I, said, I have four children and I they you know millennial generation X the whole nine yards P individuals now are less apt to plan for and anticipate the future as they did in previous generations. Um, uh, I'll worry about it later as opposed to I'll start having my life insurance taken out now. Uh, but in in the funeral uh, today, there's, there's sometimes no funeral. There's no remembrance. It's just a, a family. Uh, many of the people that I, that I know, and even some relatives, I've never had an opportunity to personally grieve or, or go to a place. It's What's happened isn't it? to grief? So. People still, well, again, let's go back to that technology piece a little bit. Yeah. People still grieve. Um, we, I th we, I think we used to think of um, people as having a support network. Part of the grieving process was to have that support network of being surrounded by family and friends at a time of need. Yeah. We still see that. 
But people are deriving a lot of network by, as I said, by online, by emails, by texting, by Facebooking, and somehow uh, they're finding their network of support that way. Um, people are still grieving. There are still funerals, um, many of them. We are, what is, we're, we're only a week into this month, and I believe we already have two dozen funerals. That's an uh, amazing number. Um, what is different is we are seeing more uh, cremations um, and less burials, perhaps. Um, we are still seeing funerals. Um, there are also some things that are called direct cremations or straight cremations. Um, people are minimizing their expenses. Someone passes away in the hospital, family comes in to make the arrangements, and they've decided, or the individual decided before they died, uh, that they don't want to be grieved publicly, even privately. And so um, it is just literally sort of the bringing the body into our care, going through the process, the paperwork process, the verification process, and then the cremation. Um, more and more people have been doing that. Um, if I can say one thing, if I may, sure. uh, uh, about cremation. Cremation is not uh, 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 an alternative to a funeral. Cremation is just an alternative to a burial. What we do see quite a bit of are people who come in and they have visitations, wakes, calling hours, if you will. We call them visitations, um, where the family receives the guests at the funeral home. Um, sometimes there is a viewing. Sometimes somebody has been cremated beforehand. But sometimes there's a viewing in a casket visitation, church service perhaps, mm -hmm. and then the disposition ultimately is cremation so that they can bring the ashes home with them or bury the ashes. So the cremation is just the final disposition as opposed to a burial. We still see a lot of these traditional funerals that end in cremation. Does that, I don't, does that make yeah, sense? It does. Uh, if someone uh, I, I'm sure it makes things a lot easier if you pre-plan your uh, end of life or if you go to a funeral home and you work out what arrangements you, you, you want. So one hmm. of my first questions is, if, if one of the spouses has died or you're divorced and you have five children, who gets to claim the body? Okay, so, so you've given me two different questions, if you will. Okay. So if I may, yeah. uh, the, the first one is, um, uh, let's answer the second question first, if I may. So someone has passed away. Uh, the first question was about pre-planning. Right. Okay, I'd like to address that in a moment, if I may. Go ahead. The second question is, um, let's say there was no pre-planning and there is either a spouse or no surviving spouse, and let's say there are five kids. Right. So, the determination of who's going to make the decisions about the funeral arrangements, because there was no pre-planning. So, so the, the, the person who passed away didn't express in writing with the funeral director and reduce to a you know, document, if you will, what I want and how I want it. That's, that's not here, let's say. They pass away. No spouse, five kids, they don't get along. One says, dad wanted to be cremated. One says, oh my God, dad always told me he wants a full-blown celebration of life and a tradition and be, to be buried alongside mom. Mm -hmm. Third one agrees with the first, the fourth one's up in the air, the fifth one says, I, I don't want to be a part of it, this is making me crazy. Um, what happens? Because there's no consensus. Um, the law is clear that a next of kin needs to be able to authorize the arrangements. It's not up to the funeral director to sign documents and decide what's going to happen. They need the next of kin. In this case, we have, let's say, five next of kin at the same level of kinship. They need to reach an agreement. And the funeral director, a skilled funeral director, will work with them and almost mediate 
you know, okay, let's discuss this. Let's, let's, you say dad wanted cremation, you say dad wanted a full traditional. You can have the full traditional and result in a cremation, whatever it may be. If, if after a short period of time, the family can't come to a consensus, the funeral director is going to say, we can't move forward until we have that consensus. Almost always they reach a consensus. They're advised by the funeral director that this isn't about you, this is about the loved one. What did they want? Let's reach that conclusion. Almost always that happens. There are some times when you need to go to court. You ask, have to approach the probate court. That happens so extraordinarily and frequently because most times the family has an aha moment with the help of the funeral director. Mm -hmm. Come together, make a decision, put your differences aside, you don't ever want to speak to each other again, that's fine. But right now, your job is to do what's right. Which is why the first question that you asked is so huge. Right. It's a gift. And, and I don't say that lightly. It's a gift. Um, when someone makes their plans known to the family and or the funeral director, um, it takes off the table any potential for dispute, any guilt that a family member may have that they're not doing the right thing. Uh, uh, it, is, it is a gift. And, and, and it, it, is it, when I go to the director pre-planning, right, mm -hmm. I say, I don't want my eyeglasses on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I want to be I, wearing the shirt that I'm wearing right now today. Right, and, and I want a simple wooden coffin in the Jewish tradition, you know, mm -hmm. th that is a traditional mm -hmm. way. Um, so do I sign a piece of paper that absolutely has the, the bearing of law? Yes, it's a contract. And, and let me say this, you will be asked, let's, and I can only speak for Dyer Lake, but, but you will be asked, for example, um, about everything that's important to you, whether or not it's, and, and we do a lot of Jewish services, and I understand, um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and no, no metal hinges on the casket, and a whole host of things. Um, you will be asked everything uh, from what you will be wearing, and let's say it's an, an open casket. Right. Um, uh, what you're wearing, what, uh, what music you may wish to be played at the time, what uh, prayers uh, may be offered in addition to what a rabbi may be offering, a whole host of things. It'll be a contract that you sign. Here's a point though, uh, a takeaway point if I may. You don't have to pay though, and it's still a binding contract. Yeah. You don't have to pay if you don't want to. And you can pay to guarantee the cost so that 10 years from now, everything that's funeral related is guaranteed. We can't guarantee the cost of flowers, for example, or what are called outside services because the cost of an obituary used to be free. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Um, but the funeral related services, guaranteed if you wish to pay now. Or you may say, what's most important is for you to memorialize my wishes in writing, I don't want to pay. My family can pay later, or this is where the money is going to be for them to pay. Two different issues. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's treated like a contract. It's an agreement. Um, and your wish is the funeral home's command. That's it's as simple as that. How, and that's why it's such a gift. Yeah. From a business point of view, if I'd made these arrangements 20 years ago, mm -hmm. right? How will the funeral home today make any money from it because of inflation? That's, the, that's, that's just the way it is. The only thing that we guarantee, for example, is the funeral-related services. Mm -hmm. um, what's, not, what's not being able to be guaranteed are what we have no control over, as I said. Um, right. that is, that's a risk that's taken, um, but it's, it's, it's part of the, the, the law and the regulations are guaranteed versus non-guaranteed. And if it's guaranteed, that's what it means, it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Yes. Um, and just interestingly, um, um, you may make your arrangements at a local funeral home and move to Florida. Whether or not you wish to keep them here or transfer them to Florida, the law is very clear. 
Um, the FTC regulates, the Federal Trade Commission regulates f the funeral industry. Um, and there's something called the funeral rule. It's a, a federal regulations. You wish to transfer those prearrangements to another funeral home, you're, uh, you, you may do so, no questions asked. So just because you've made your arrangements at one funeral home doesn't mean that if your situation has changed geographically, your kids have all moved out west, you don't want to be alone when you pass away buried here, you make arrangements with a funeral home someplace else, transferable. So there's really no downside. And what it does do, it completely eliminates that mom wanted this, dad wanted this yeah. kind of thing. And uh, you might, uh, if you go out of the country, you might want to think about buying insurance in case you die outside of the country, mm -hmm. because it's a very expensive to bring the remains back to the to the United States. It can be. We we've we've had we've had people who have passed away everywhere from Africa to Mexico. Um, it can be. And what we do is we we contract with we work with a few a funeral home in in another country, for example, and we're culture and customs are very different, right. but they will arrange the body, prepare the body, and then have it flown to us. Yeah. Um, it's not an insurmountable task. We do it uh, on, a, on an occasional basis, yeah. yes. Let's cover for a minute if someone dies in the house. Okay. Uh, what, are, what are the scenario, different scenarios that okay. happen? So if someone unexpectedly passes away at home, the first call that needs to be made is to 911, the police. Um, on occasion, a family will call us and say, someone has just passed at home, my dad just died, can you, can you come get my dad? Have you called 911 yet? No. Okay, first call 911, then we'll, 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 do, we'll bring the individual into our care. Someone passes away unexpectedly at home, police, 911. They'll come out to the house. And they will uh, make an assessment, the police will, whether or not it looks as if, uh, for example, someone uh, has, a, uh, has a known health care history, um, they've been under the care of a physician, there are prescription medications right there, there's no obvious signs of any foul play of any kind. What they will do is they will contact the medical examiner in Boston, the office of the chief medical examiner convey that information to them on the phone. And the ME's office may say, we're going to decline involvement. It's called declining jurisdiction. The ME is going to say, we don't need to be involved. Based on what you're telling us, we're satisfied that there's no untoward uh, uh, foul play or anything like that. In which case, then, we will bring the individual into our care. And we will get paperwork from the ME that said, they've declined jurisdiction. Now, if someone sees, uh, the police sees something very unusual, or it's a young person, or um, uh, they've had an, clearly an accident in the home that has caused their death, uh, the medical examiner may get involved and may wish to come out to the scene and or come and view the, the body um, and, and take it, the body back into their care. Is the medical examiner by by county or is it a state? state? It's by uh, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and they have offices in uh, various locations in in the Springfield area on the Cape, and the main office is right on Albany Street in in Boston. Um, but they do have different satellite offices. It's one state agency, um, and and so they will make a determination. T talking about cemeteries for a minute. Uh, when you buy a plot in a cemetery, interesting enough, you don't own it. At least the cemetery that that I've. Well, you do have an ownership interest in it. It's a piece of real estate. You have a, you have an ownership. I can't interest. sell it. You can. I, it depends upon the cemetery. Oh. It depends upon oh, the cemetery oh. whether or not you can or cannot sell it. Um, some cemeteries require that you have to offer to them first. Um, but you can't. Some cemeteries you can sell your, your lot. It depends upon the agreement, the contract that you've signed with each of the individual cemeteries. Well, I can tell you, Forest Hills, <laughs> you have to offer it back yeah, to them. Yeah, and and you only get 
the, you only get what you pay what now, you what the for. going rate is, if you will. It varies from cemetery to cemetery. That's interesting. May I say one thing? Sure. If I can go back so I can complete the answer on yeah. the... Go uh, ahead. If someone dies at home under hospice care, for example... Right. Um, hospice would be contacted by the family, for example. I'm going to call the... If a patient's been treated by a visiting nurse, right. for example, end-of-life visiting nurse... Uh, the family would contact them first, who will probably then, not probably, they will come out, and they are able to then pronounce the individual as having died and complete paperwork. So 911 doesn't need to be involved in that instance, nor does the medical examiner, because it was an expected death. death. And then typically hospice would contact the funeral home and then bring the individual into our care. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. I just no wanted problem. to get the unexpected versus expected. No. Jay, we have a short period of time left. W what is something that is important that we haven't discussed that, that you'd like to uh, bring up? Um, I, I just I think I want to underscore the importance and appropriateness of making prearrangements and people not being scared that they have to write a check at the moment, that it is, it is such a, 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 a godsend to family members to be able to say what you wanted, how you wanted things, and so there's no questions asked by anybody. It's your opportunity to choose for yourself and you have the peace of mind. You mentioned obituaries uh, are cost a lot of money. Yes. Uh, you actually kind of inspired me. I, <laughs> I began to write my own obituary, but it's nothing like a normal obituary. Uh, All the better. It, 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 but wh where is the cost? Why is okay, it? Okay, the cost is if you wish it to be published in a newspaper. Who uh, reads the newspaper? And that, <laughs> you've just <laughs> answered the, the question. Um, and a funeral home will publish an obituary. You've written your own obituary, for example. Uh, the funeral home will publish it on their website. No cost. That's part of what they do as part of the funeral arrangements. If you want it published in the Boston Globe, the Province Journal, the local paper in Franklin, or the Sun Chronicle, there's a cost associated with publication, both online and in print. And the reason it's so expensive is because you sort of said the answer. People aren't reading the paper as much. The advertisers aren't paying a lot of money. And so the cost to publish an obituary can be hundreds and thousands of dollars even, depending upon the newspaper. But not in the funeral home's own website, for example. Veterans. Veterans in Massachusetts have at least two cemeteries that can, they, they can be buried in. One is the National Cemetery uh, down by Bourne and on the Cape. Correct. What happens if they're married? Uh, say, do, do, do you make arrangements before a, I, as a veteran? I have a short answer for Go. the veteran. The National Cemetery, located in Bourne, it's a beautiful place. Um, and if you've ever gone and been there, yeah. there are no headstones, there are no gravestones, they're all grave markers on the ground. A veteran with an honorable discharge and their spouse and dependent child. Those, the veteran, spouse, and a dependent child with an honorable discharge are entitled to be buried and born at no cost with a grave marker uh, and the opening and closing, if you will, what's called the opening and closing for the, for the, for the grave site. It, that's covered by uh, the, f the federal government as, uh, as, a, as a veteran with an honorable discharge. That's black and white. And the state has one in a town kind of in central mass that I, uh, the name is escaping yeah. me. And I can't really speak to the state one as much because uh, in, so far in my experience, we've always dealt with born. born so right. I don't want to misstate and misrepresent. Right. I know how born works. A c question though. Sure. The veteran decides to be buried with his family or whatever, right? Yes. Does the spouse and dependents have any right then to be buried? No, it has the to be the veteran. Has to be no. It's got to be the veteran and then their spouse and or dependent. So if the veteran though, if the wife passes away first, and the veteran expresses that he he wants to be buried there, then it's okay for the wife. My understanding is that's correct. Good. 
Jay Elias. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Attorney for Dyer, Dyer Lake, Lake and North Attleboro. And North Attleboro. Yes, sir. You know, this has been a pleasure. Thank we'll you. Do, we'll do it again. Okay, I look forward right. to it. Thank you. This is uh, Frank Falvey with Frank Presents, and uh, both of us thank you for watching, and we hope you listen and take uh, seriously the topics and the things that we brought up. Uh, you can always uh, reach Jay at Dyer Lake, uh, and if you have any comments uh, on the program, feel, feel free to reach the studio. Thank you very much. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.